Some doctors believe the promise of gene therapy is so great that they're pressing ahead and trying to eliminate its risks. This is what they're doing in a joint trial between the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Stanford University for the single gene disorder, haemophilia. As the blood gets older, it'll get darker, but what's concerning me is that it's actually bigger than the other side, so it's not just a bruise on the skin. Two-year-old haemophiliac Dylan has a faulty gene passed on from his mother on the X chromosome. His body doesn't produce enough of the blood clotting agent Factor 9, so he bleeds very easily. Today he's receiving an emergency dose of synthetic Factor 9. The factor is expensive, between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars per patient per year, so over half the sufferers in the world can't afford it. Patients can become immune to it, and it's painful to administer. Jack, you know what? Actually, no, I'm going to right here, but I'm right here. Okay, For six years, Dr. Katie Mano and Professor Kathy High have been working to design a safer virus to deliver a synthetic clotting gene. Haemophiliacs like Dylan only produce around 1% of normal clotting factor levels. Just a slight increase would make all the difference. People who have slightly higher levels, say 3 to 4%, those people experience many fewer spontaneous bleeding episodes or dangerous bleeding episodes. So if we were able to maintain circulating levels in the range of a few percent and would allow him to basically be free of the fear of spontaneous bleeding episodes. Four months ago, 31-year-old Chris Brent traveled from Australia to the US for the trial. He and his doctor had spent months persuading the Australian government to allow him to take part. Uh, it's oftentimes quite difficult to uh, know what a lot of these regulatory uh, committees require and so it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to uh, fill out the paperwork, make certain that all of the right things have been done. There's no doubt that the tragic death of Jesse Gelsinger has changed not only clinical gene therapy trials but in fact all clinical trials the world over. I was aware that uh, studies in America on gene therapy had been halted in 1999 after uh, there had been a death in a trial of someone who had uh, OTC deficiency. There were some small concerns but I was probably more interested in the, the big picture that could potentially benefit a lot of people. The synthesized factor 9 gene was injected directly into Chrissy's liver, a simple one-off procedure. Within three weeks of the trial, Chrissy's body began to produce its own factor nine, something he'd never experienced before. After six weeks, the new gene had pushed his factor level up to an amazing 12 percent. I mean, when I found out that my body was producing its own factor nine, it was quite exciting. You know, I felt probably that I could push myself a bit further and uh, wouldn't have to worry about uh, any bleeds. This is the goal that we had been working for, for more than five years, nearly ten years. So it was a really wonderful moment. We have learned through the years not to get too excited <laughs> until time goes by, but we were cautiously optimistic. Yep. And Professor High was right to be cautious. After the initial improvement, Chrissy's factor 9 levels began to drop back down. In addition, his liver had an immune reaction to the new gene, causing hepatitis. I guess I was a bit disappointed that, uh, you know, this uh, factor that I had started to produce was now dropping, but uh, other than that, I don't think it caused me any great anxiety. My liver's fine now, I believe. It certainly can cope with a few drinks, so uh, that's all I ask of it. Our poll asked people if they'd carry on with gene therapy if they knew patients had died from the treatment. Very few from the UK or America would continue. I think it would depend on my circumstance. If it were, um, if I were terminally ill, if this was something that could uh, kill me, I don't think there would be many choices left and I would be for it. If I was dying, I would probably still be willing to take a risk, but I suppose you would always have to weigh it against 
side effects and how long you were likely to have your life prolonged? If someone had died from having the treatment uh, before they wanted to give it to me, I would assume, I would hope, that it had been through more trials. Well, I feel very bad about messing with our genes. Uh, of course, our genes have to develop in a natural way. I don't, I don't think we have to manip manipulate with them. It's an unfortunate truth in medicine that many um, treatments which have become standard in their early days were tremendously dangerous. The classic one is of heart transplants, and the early heart transplants in the 60s had no chance of survival at all. And they wouldn't be allowed at all nowadays. But if they hadn't been done, we wouldn't have the standard technology of heart transplant. Now, gene therapy today is nothing like as risky as that. But it would be foolish to deny that there are real risks, some of which perhaps we don't know yet. However, if we don't take those risks, gene therapy will never go anywhere. So rather reluctantly, I think we do have to take them, even though it may cost, unfortunately, some human lives. For Chris, gene therapy is a risk that appears to have paid off in an unforeseen way. Well, since I had the gene therapy, uh, which was four and a half months ago, I've only had one bleed. Um, so that's pretty extraordinary for me. I normally would have one bleed every two weeks. And it's actually been three months now since I've uh, had a bleed. Can't entirely explain why, but uh, it's been very good. In Australia, there are strong hopes that Chris Brent's experience will allow more gene therapy trials to go ahead. The consequence of this is very exciting and indeed is a major advance in gene therapy insofar as we're seeing the first glimpse of the possibility of a therapeutic benefit in a human being uh, receiving gene therapy. In addition, he still seems to have been benefiting from the gene therapeutic procedure in a way that we don't fully understand. Even with successes like Chris, some believe we're trying to run before we can walk. We just don't know enough about our genes to start experimenting with them to this extent. We only have 30,000 or so genes, but there may be two or 300,000 proteins those genes code for. What the molecular biologist can't tell you is why does a gene decide to code for one protein versus another? So I think what we have yet to explore are what are those subtle factors out in the environment that may affect why genes become one protein versus another, and that's way down the line. Replacement gene therapy involving the introduction of new genes will continue to carry risks until we know exactly how genes work. But new research here at the University of York could prove much safer. Instead of replacing a faulty gene, it destroys its message by attacking the messenger. It's the first step in tackling the biggest killer of all, cancer. This is the nucleus of a cervical cancer cell that has been forced to self-destruct. The cancer is caused by a sexually transmitted virus called HPV. Every year, 400,000 women across the world are killed by it. Medical pioneer Professor Joe Milner has spent three years trying to find ways of defeating it. Inside the nucleus of a healthy cell are the genes P53 and RB. These two genes suppress tumor formation by controlling the rate that our cells divide and destroying any damaged cells that might become cancerous. Cervical cancer occurs when the cancer virus enters the cell and attacks the tumor suppressor genes by placing two of its own genes, E6 and E7, into the human genome. These take over the reins of cell growth and force the cells to divide in an uncontrollable manner, causing cancer. 